interview for the high, failed haiku interview series. And uh, Kala Ramesh and myself, we are going to conduct it today. And we have a special guest, Michael Railing. Da, da, da. Who is that guy? So, yeah, about Mike, uh, I think I tried to find out some words in dictionaries, but uh, I think dictionaries are not updated well. Uh, maybe they are running short of words. So, um, but after having some recent experiences and uh, recent interaction with Mike, um, I think he has some great qualities. I mean, his dedication, his devotion, his passion, his compassion, his kindness, his wittiness, his affection, his love and his humor. You name it. I mean, he is the combination of all these uh, great qualities. And uh, Mike did not bribe me to say all this. Let me, let me be very clear on that. <laughs> So before I ask uh, uh, Kala to share her experience with Mike, I want to say that it's a great privilege and honor for me um, to be with two great names from oh, no. the haiku world. Kala herself, she is a, a role model and a great inspiration to all of us. And thank you guys for having me. And um, now I'm going to stop now. And Kala, say something about Mike. And it should be something else. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hifsa. Mike, thank you so much for allowing, giving us this honor to interview you. It's nice. It's a beautiful feeling. And uh, when Hifsa told me and I said, yes, we'll do it. We'll both of us, we can do it. And then, and then I said to interview you who has been so well known, not because of what you are or what you did, but what you have done for the Haikai world. And I've been there and I've witnessed so much of what you have done. And your bio says, a quite vegan, and I wouldn't say you're quiet, you've created waves, you've created waves all over. And uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, and um, I would now like to go to the first question. And, and of course, I would like to say, I'm sure our viewers and our failed haiku uh, enthusiasts would love to know who the hell is Mike Railing. And so please give us a background or talk about your uh, childhood days or whatever it is you want to tell us about. Thank you, Mike. Well, to you. good. Thank you. You guys uh, flatter me, but uh, uh, I thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. This was your idea. And uh, I couldn't say no, because you both consented to be interviewed by me. It's hard for me to say no. So no problem, though. If I was going to be interviewed by anyone, it's going to you, you two are great. Good choices. But uh, no, I'm uh, uh I'm from uh, Michigan. Uh, that's that's pretty much where I was born and raised. But my family, um, uh, my grandfather came over here when he was ten years old, uh, after just before World War One, and uh, my and they were displaced persons. They were uh, they were uh, uh, refugees. They were had nothing. And when I say nothing. My grandfather, when he was a kid, he picked apples and peaches up in uh, uh, the Thumb area of Michigan. And he, he had no place to sleep. So he would clean up at the general store if they allowed him to sleep in front of the uh, stove at night. Now, they wouldn't let him put, put fire, put wood in the stove, but the stove would be warm enough to last a good piece of time. And then when he was uh, 15 years old, this, he's my idol. So that's why I'm telling you this. Yes. 15 years old, he went to work for a, a startup company in Flint, Michigan called General Motors. You might've heard of it. Yes, yes. And he, he, was, a, he was a carpenter. When, people in his family, my, my grandmother used to remind us constantly we were peasant stock. He said, don't you be... 
Don't you be putting on any airs, kids. Your peasants <laughs> die. Both of my grandmothers were uh, maids in uh, wealthy people's homes in Detroit. And uh, but uh, my grandfather wound up over the years, he stayed for 35 years and he wound up, believe it or not, as an executive at General Motors, uh, working Fantastic. in the design studio. And to his day, dying day, he lived to be 96. I'm hoping to emulate him. He kept a uh, English to German dictionary because he, he never went past maybe the third or fourth grade. That's what I learned. So when I, uh, as I was growing up, we were very fortunate. You know, we never starved. We never, and I wouldn't have, known, my, my grandparents would never, and my parents would never have told us if we had a problem. <laughs> they wouldn't have mentioned it. But, uh, and uh, when my wife and I got married, um, and that's the biggest part of the story is, and she, she's in the other room. She, you know, I don't think she can hear this. But she's the big influence on my life. Known my wife for 58 years. And uh, we've been together for over 50, married for over 48 years, two great kids. And I'm still peasant stock. I'm never going to be. <laughs> and we live in the woods uh, in the middle of, we got about six, seven acres of oak, oak forest. And so when I tell people that's my bio that people laugh at, that's all I am. And I am quiet. I'm the quietest person. If, you, if, I, if I'm not on video or in a haiku meeting, I'm pretty quiet because it's just Abaddon. We're just, we, we just spend our time together. Now, I've flown all over the world. I worked. I worked at banks and stuff like that. Lucky. And so I, I've got to go to India been all over Europe. I've wandered all over. Been almost every, I can't think of a state in the United States I haven't been to. Most of the national parks. Um, and uh, I've lived in a number of places, California, Arizona, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Michigan, obviously, uh, Moberly, Missouri. Uh, so that's, that's who I am. I've just wandered around and uh, I've, I've never, I've, I've had some wonderful opportunities. I've never been unemployed a day in my life that I didn't want to be, but several times I just left. <laughs> so I, so although I've done a lot of things and been a lot of places, people don't know that about me. That's why I would say, they don't know. They say, well, he was a banker. Well, sort of, kind of. Uh, the, uh, and I did mostly uh, lending to uh, uh, small tickets, uh, uh, people. We uh, we had a small. Uh, we lent to people who couldn't get approved anywhere else. We got them computers. We used to do a lot of that. So those are the things that we've done. I've got to meet a lot of very famous people, and but mostly the people that I have met that I that were had the biggest impression on me were the haiku poets. Uh, uh, that I've met. And Kala, you're one of them. You're a big influence on me. Thank you. Uh, we've known you. I've known you for 20 years. I've known Hifsa for a few years. Yes. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it's been a lot of fun. I got into haiku by yeah. accident, like everybody does. Yes. And Michael, uh, I think you touch a chord in all of us when you spoke about your grandfather. Because we have come through. My father was a motherless child. And I know how he brought all three of us and he became a doctor and he wanted to study further, but he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And he used to collect two rupees per injection. And that is how we all grew up. Two rupees per injection is, I think it is 70 rupees a dollar. So what is two rupees? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. But, but your story reverberates and then I say, my God, we are all, some way we join together, we all come together. It is this resonance that happens in our lives. So I drove, I drove a cab. I drove a cab in the city of Detroit for two years. Look at that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I still have a chauffeur's license just for the joke of it. I, I, I've, I've all, <laughs> and we, we, we lived in it. We, the first uh, house, Ab and I 
lived in really, uh, it was an old duplex that was falling down. We rented it. And the only reason I could do it is because he agreed to waive three months of rent if I painted this house. And it was like a three-story house. And you painted it. Rickety ladders. I think of it today and I think I could have been dead, you know, just trying to save the save the rent. But that uh, it's a it's a weird thing. I mean, my my oldest son said <laughs> one time he said, Dad, I've never known anybody who made as much money as you and as little money as you, one after the other. <laughs> so I, I've been on both sides of the coin and uh, I've, I, I've learned one thing and that is that uh, uh, one of my favorite writers, uh, he's passed away a long time ago, and you may not even know him, is Studs Terkel. And Studs Terkel, you look him up, he did interviews with average people. He was interviewing stevedores and iron workers and garbage men. And he, that's what he did. And they were great books. And uh, to me, that's, that's the thing. The other thing that gets me into to haiku and senru, we may as well talk about it. That is actually why we're here. What got me into it is that is, is you look at the little things that, uh, of life and, the, and the, the things that appear insignificant, okay, in your life. Those people are smarter than our politicians. 99% of our intellectuals, smart, pardon me, and I say nothing bad about it. I have PhDs all over my family. I, what can I say? Uh, but uh, I, all, all those people have their heads in the cloud. But my, do we come back to my grandfather? He was the most straightforward, honest, kind man. Lovely. Wow, this is yep, yeah, totally amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just absorbing all these things and various aspects of your personal journey. So uh, now you have mentioned that you are interested in small things. That's why um, you uh, you like this uh, form of haiku, like senryu. Yeah. So how did you get interested um, in haiku? What inspired you? And what sustains your passion for this one? Well, uh, I tell people this all the time. I, I should, should actually find it, pull it off the shelf someplace here. It's somewhere. Wait a second. <laughs> yes. Here you go. You want my inspiration? Hang it off my. <laughs> These were. Um, ah. These were haiku books. They were put out by a publishing company called Peter Popper Press. And they cost $1. They're hardcover books. Not great hardcover books, but hardcover books. And um, I tell you all the time, the haiku in them, not, not all of them are haiku. <laughs> they, they managed to put <laughs> their poor translations um, uh, one time I had, uh, uh, many years ago, Randy Brooks was looking at me reading this book. We were at a cradle thing and he said, you know, those are terrible translations. I said, yeah, but that's all I had. I didn't have anything at the time. It's the 60s. It was 1964. And I was buying my first books for college at the, at the college bookstore. And right by the wow. checkout counter is the Peter Popper Press for one more dollar. And a, and a dollar was a dollar back then. <laughs> it's actually yes. 64. It would have been $12 today. There was this book and I bought it. Had a lot of Zen sayings in it that aren't haiku, poor translations. But then uh, I got into it and I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll go to the library. because I'm out of college with a gigantic library. Michigan State University is absolutely beautiful if you're a haiku poet. It's, it's an agricultural college. And I, I joke with people, all the trees had tags with their Latin names. <laughs> on the, the flowers bloomed all the time. So I went to the library and I got a copy of Mio Mori's book. It's a huge dictionary-like book. He conned the uh, emperor of Japan in the 30s. He said, these Americans are, they're translating our poetry and if we don't get a handle on it, they're going to, their translations oh. are going to 
going to count and not ours. So Miyamori compiled, I don't know, it's a 900 page book. Uh, and not just Basho and Busan and Isa, but all the students of, of Basho, mm -hmm. Kiori and others and uh, translated them along with 1819 plates of, uh, of, of, the, of art. Uh, and he put them together. And it, I had two copies at one time. I, I've given them away now. One is in Australia. And the other one, I think, is in India. But uh, he, uh, I got there and read these 900. And it was, of course, different than the Peter Popper. <laughs> But I started to get interested in it, but for 30 years, I pretty much just did it badly, so badly that I wouldn't show it to anybody. I wouldn't talk about it. And I was off leading my life. I was having kids and buying a house and doing what you do in life. And somewhere in the 90s, I slowed down long enough. So I picked it up again. And about that time, Prodigy and, and uh People don't even remember Prodigy and CompuServe. Before there was AOL, before there was the, the, the internet we think about it today with these little dial-up services that, well, on there, as the internet began to grow, I was working for a Japanese bank. I went to work for Sanwa, a trillion dollar Japanese bank. And uh, so I was now doubly exposed. I had Japanese translators running yes. around all the time, and I had people. Oh. I was interested in it, and at that it slowly happened. And in the '90s, I met, and I say this all the time: it's people need to just understand I have no prejudice against my own gender. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the women of haiku, Francine Parag, uh, just too many people to name. They were just so kind to me. Anya, uh, the World Haiku Club. All, all of these people were, were very nice and encouraged. Me. And that's why the, the, the biggest thing, if you're going to be yes. a teacher and wow. Kala does it and Issa, you do it, is you have to, you, you have to encourage other people to enjoy and support their own work. Whether anybody yes. else reads it, I don't really care. I have tens of thousands of poems, no exaggeration. I've been published well over a thousand times. Everybody goes, oh, it can't be, it can't be a thousand. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it took me 30 years to do it. <laughs> it wasn't like it happened yesterday. <laughs> and, but, uh, and, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that uh, the kind of people that encourage me and, and help me. And uh, we're going to talk about it, I hope, later. But we did a bunch of things where we just went and hid together on the Internet. And, and hung out as poets with no big eyes and little U's and no experts. And I am not an expert in anything. I'm not even an expert in being Mike Railing. Every morning I wake up and surprise myself. I'm a new person, new ideas. That's good, that's good, that's good. So I stumbled into it and you can thank the Peter Popper Press. Don't recommend you buy them, but I, I still keep mine. Uh, I, I was going to ask, where can I find these books? And uh, thank you, Mike, for sharing all these things. And I uh, honestly, I did not read a lot about uh, haiku. I learned haiku by reading the work of other haiku poets. And this is a great secret. Like you get inspiration, a lot of inspirations, um, even from beginners. And uh, it's good to know about all these uh, stuff. And I will just make a list of all these uh, books, or uh, maybe uh, that historical things. <laughs> quite, yeah. quite a, so hopefully, I'll read them. And I'll share my experiences. Or maybe I'll refine my haiku more after reading uh, this stuff. So Kala, do you have any questions related yes. to another cool. adventure of uh, Mike? That is haiku. I do. Haiku. I'm going to ask him about the haiku hut that he created. <laughs> it was my second home when, when he opened the gates to me. And I mean, what can I say? I mean, you were there, Mike, and all the poets were there. We were all like a family helping each other to grow. How did you think of doing this so many years back? I don't know when it started, but 
and how many members were there by the time you decided to close up? And it was a shock to me. I don't know about the others. And why did you do it? Well, uh, we started it. It was uh, early in 2000. I think we started talking about it. Maybe by 2001, mm. we got it up. I have servers. I still do. I still rent my own servers, have my own thing in the cloud. And I had this space and I had, and we were on different forums. Uh, Marley Mountain yes. had one. Uh, Basho's Beatniks was another. <laughs> uh, the World Haiku Club was certainly another. I mean, Sassoon did a fantastic job of bringing a lot of people together. But they were so large and people would argue. <clears throat> not, not well. I mean, you know, and some people were too harsh in their critiques. I'm sometimes accused of being too harsh. Sometimes I'm accused of being too easy. <laughs> it depends. But uh, the, I, we wanted to have a spot. And it was uh, just some of the people. Uh, it was you, Carla, Linda Papa Giorgio with. Uh, uh, How many? Uh, yeah. Uh, Larry. 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 Oh, Larry. Oh, God. Larry Lee. Dawn. So beautiful. She passed away. I have. Lauren a, Ford. I have a beautiful booklet she made for me. I sent her a digital camera because she wanted to do high gun. I had, I'm always buying new technology. So I have a bunch of stuff laying around and I, I sent it to her. She did a book of high for me. <clears throat> yes. She was very good. Yeah. She was very good she, just before she died. Yes. But, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And what you created, uh, Mike, um, uh, it is, uh, you've been constantly doing that. You've been giving a new venue and a new place for people to grow. And I think that is one of your plus points. It's, it's a huge plus point in your uh, thinking capacities. And I think it's, you've done wonders. Well, I could, <laughs> here's the thing. Yes. Here's the thing that I tried to do. It has not a little to do with me. I guess I put up I put a platform up and I set some very basic rules. The most basic one, which I tell you all the time, is the poet rules. If you want to sit, tell Kala you yeah. don't like line two, that you're fine. You feel free to let her know. If you say, Kala, that whole poem, put it in a dumpster. You know, that's okay. You can say that. But in the end, Kala gets to decide when she's done with her poem and what it's supposed to look like. Yes. Okay. And uh, people like uh, Lauren Ford was there. Ron Moss was there. Uh, Jean Murtha was there. Linda. Linda was there. Mm. Every, everybody, we had about 65 people who routinely were there all Okay. The and when we started, most of us were not great haiku poets. We were not getting published and modern haiku wasn't begging us to submit. Believe me, it didn't happen. But but we were we we all were at about the same level. I, I learned a great deal about uh, Haiga from Ron Moss. We we played with Photoshop together. He got his copy. I got mine. We were fooling around with stuff, and uh, uh, but in the end, we we treated each other well. And there's lots of people. Jane Reichold yes. jumped in, jumped in and out. Uh, I think uh, you know, and we had contests and stuff like that where I would find some prizes and stuff like that, and we would have contests. We we judged yes. each other's poetry before we would enter it into a contest, so we could you could have other people's opinions. And uh, out of it, got yeah, Paul Woodward was there, Ray Rasmussen was there, Glenn Coates yes. was there. I, mean, I can't list Karen. everybody, but we out of out of silly haiku hut, which is nothing more than a little bulletin board system. Dozen journals came out. I started short stuff shortly thereafter. Did twenty four months of that. Uh, so I I uh, it was just a crazy idea, and I don't take great deal of credit for it. I take great deep great deal of credit for the fact that. If you put together a whole bunch of good people, good things happen. You yeah. just have to yes. leave them alone. 
you have to leave them alone and let good things happen. I'm not going to write like you, Kala, because I don't live your life. I, yes. But I can, but your life has pieces of mine. And that's what people need to understand about haiku. Uh, uh, Bill Higginson, a big influence on me, but he said, I, I, you quote him all the time on this. He said, if you don't understand linking and shifting, if you don't understand link verse, you will not understand haiku. <laughs> And I, Absolutely. I, at first I didn't understand and he, he beat it into my head. He said, I don't care whether you write link verse, Mike. He said, but a, a haiku is a hoku. And if that's how it began. And so if you don't give people anything to hang on to, if all they've got is you, your image, your experience alone, you haven't given them much. If so, that's what you do in your work. You don't give... You, you give a voice to other people, other situations, uh, you know, and, and that's what makes you unique. And that's what makes you powerful. Kala does the same thing. And both of you are encouraging positive people to other people. So it's fun to bump into you on social media, either one of you. Bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You were, you're, uh, I still remember it was a home for all of us. It was beautiful. That was, that you that was a good place. Home. Good place. Lovely. Hipsa, Hipsa, over to you now. Yes, there is a question about, and I think I missed a lot back in 2010 and 2011, and there was a virtual haiku on Facebook. Mike, what was the story? I mean, you have 2,800 members over there. I don't know where were I at that time. <laughs> I, I, I basically did it just uh, what it, the whole the whole idea I have, and it comes through, it's failed haiku, it's these interviews, it's everything else. There's so much misinformation about haiku mm -hmm. and, and so many different things that people want to drag into it that don't belong there necessarily. <laughs> Uh, that aren't rules and there are so many things that could be in it that people want to exclude because of a rule so yes. virtual haiku i that is an open site it's got about close to three thousand people now in it 20 yeah. something like that a lot of them are lurkers you don't realize there are publishing houses publishers uh poetry magazine editors who don't publish haiku and I hear from them every once in a while. Somebody will, will, will message me and say, I'm not understanding. I thought the rules of haiku were X. And I'd say, nah, it's an opportunity to move them over to other places where there's better information. We have in, in, in haiku, I mean, there are people like Charlie Trumbull, uh, uh, who's, who's written hundreds of pages. Then there's Michael Dillon Welsh, who's written 10,000 pages or something. I, I, I wouldn't even start counting. I'm able to die before I would get to the end. And besides, he's always adding more. There's plenty of good, good sources. Anita Virgil is another one who's written a lot about haiku. A lot of people that, that we have, we have, and a lot of Bill Higginson's stuff and, uh, and Penny's is still, are still relevant and still around. Uh, Chris Kondo and uh, Tarashi Kondo worked with uh, Bill Higginson. So I figured out very early on that the web was where the world is. I'm not against print. I love print magazines. I support as many as I can. Uh, uh, but uh, I, my thing is that uh, if we're going to, if we're going to do anything, virtual haiku is a way to, to broaden it so that people yes. out there realize yes. There's something besides this five, seven, five thing you teach to five-year-olds. Not, you know, by the way, I'll say one other thing, uh, uh, the Nick uh, Vigilio Foundation, the Vigilio uh, contest, uh, Aubrey Cox and I judged it one year. We had almost 3000 entries from kids. It's all kids, little kids. blow you away i mean just yes. kills you it's a it's a they're 
there and uh, and those are those are all places the haiku foundation is another place that i i love uh, jim cation i can't say enough about uh not, not only is he a nice person but he's he's doing ridiculous things hey. much more than much more than me <laughs> he uh, it's such a rich site and it's got a lot of books and things scanned on it other people's poetry so yeah virtual haiku is is basically a very broad place i have smaller groups that i've set up that are more private and more focused but that yeah. the internet is a good place to go it's free sort of and i think um i missed a lot uh, on facebook uh, regarding haiku because I'm more active on Twitter than Facebook. And there are reasons. I mean, I get lost in, uh, into notifications. <laughs> I don't know how to reply all those back-to-back -back <laughs> notifications. So yes, it is interesting. And I hope one day I'll contribute in uh, Send You Cycle, if uh, I'm not wrong. Send You Circle, is it? Um, community on Facebook. What is that? If I, uh, is it Send You? So, yeah. Cycle or send you circle. Send you circle is the other one. That's more focused. I want to keep that oh, more for, yes. for for Senru poets who are already in the game, and uh, um, uh, that was a silly idea. That uh, not a silly idea, but an idea that came up <laughs> talking to Alan Pizzarelli and Alexis Rotella, both two fantastic poets uh, and fantastic people. That's the nice thing yes. about. Haiku is you, you meet people. Alan, Alan Pizzarelli is a pistol. I mean, he really is. He he is fun to be around, and his books, uh, Mind Zaps and Frozen Socks. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just the titles are enough to keep you going. But and uh, Alexis Rotella uh, scratches on the moon. Her hyben uh, that uh, won a touchstone last year. Those are the, that, that was just a silly idea at an HNA meeting. Another thing, I'll give you all the commercials. Haiku North America, although it's not North American anymore because we're going to go Zoom and Kala has been there. You're, you, yes. haven't, you haven't moved to US, have you? Have you? <laughs> the, <laughs> the, you can, people come from all over the world, but this year HNA is going to be all Zoom and it's free. Uh, but uh, uh, it so that's going to be a great gathering oh. and a great idea. A great and, idea. Uh, that's Michael Dillon Welsh, uh, Gary Gay, uh, Paul Miller, uh, and I'm sure there's somebody I'm going to forget who will email me afterwards. But they came up with this idea, <laughs> and it's been tremendous. And I've gotten to re to to meet Ron Moss in person and Kala and uh, just. Uh, so many people and uh i think that if people it's nice it's nice if people like what i'm doing but what i'm doing is i'm johnny appleseed we have, are you familiar with johnny appleseed story not everybody is the, the johnny appleseed was this mythical character a couple hundred years ago in america who walked around with a big bag of apple seeds and he planted oh, apple okay. seeds everywhere he went, walking around planting apple seeds. And that's how I view myself, but that's how many, many, many haiku poets see themselves. Once you get into it, you see how much fun it is and you see the, the community that's there, you want to yes. bring other people in. So, and we are seeds. There's no, there's no yes. 40 page poems in haiku. <laughs> we don't we don't write them so that's that's my thing and i want to enthuse people to do that and i want to do it you know all the world not not just in the u.s uh i think uh, the british haiku society is another strong group uh, haiku Oz in australia is another good strong group and uh there are they're, they're groups in ghana now uh in africa aji has got some good stuff going so i think you, you start to look around. Uh, that's that's what I want to do, and that's what I, everything I do is about: being Johnny Appleseed for haiku and planting the planting the seed for other people. 
Great. That's very interesting. And uh, I think one thing, I, uh, it's a shame that I never participated in uh, Sandy Circle, but I read the work of other haiku poets and I learn a lot from them because they are very good and brilliant haiku. And most of them, they are not, I think majority of them, they are, uh, uh, they are great haiku poets. They're not beginners. And uh, sometimes I read their work and I just uh, learn a lot and maybe some techniques. No, very true. And uh, yes, very dynamic and uh, uh, brilliant haiku. Uh, and uh, uh, Kala, would you like to ask about uh, yes. haiku, the idea yes. behind this great word? Because um, people used to ask me on Twitter, what is this yes. haiku if you got published in that journal? Does it mean your haiku is failed? Ah, it uh -huh. means that it's more <laughs> Mike, in, 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 Let me others. let me come yeah. there. What's the your what? I'm sorry, sorry, Ahipsa. Your virtual haiku, I think, paved the way for failed haiku, because it just it just uh, it was an organic feel when it when I saw failed haiku come into its own. Okay, and it was every month. It was something that you started and I have said, how am I going to do this every month? <laughs> okay, it's a captivating name. What a catchy name that was. And I was clean bold. But tell us what motivated you to come to the platform for, to give a, send you a platform at a time when most of the journals lumped both Haiku and send you together as Haiku. And that was a very bold move and you did it beautifully again and again, creating waves. So tell us about it, about your failed haiku. Yeah, well, failed haiku was a joke, uh, actually, that I told <laughs> <laughs> it, Yeah, we, I went to, an HNA, <laughs> <laughs> went to an HNA meeting in uh, Winston-Salem. First time it was there. Uh, Robert Moyer was the chief cook and bottle washer for that one. And uh, uh, Alan Pizzarelli gave a presentation on Senra. And um, uh, Senryu, by the way, is the way you actually pronounce it. But I've Thank given you. up trying to convert people. Alan <laughs> hasn't, but I've given up. It's Senryu, and I've given up. But uh, uh, he gave a presentation. And it was fantastic. Uh, uh, and Alan's a great presenter, and he's a funny guy. And to begin with, but he's also an academic. He's he has that. I don't know that he like hearing that, but he has it. He has, he has the quality of being analytical. Alexis Rotilla does too. Alexis is yes. one of those people. She she writes these off the cuff, and so does Alan. Really, about yes. Human nature, and you think, oh, this is. But they they're thinking about it. There's something behind it behind every Alan Pizzarelli poem or every Alexis Rotilla poem that is deeper than the smile or the, or the sadness that it brings you. That's the other thing Alan makes clear. So I'm not, I'm really not an expert at Senru, but I follow two experts at Senru. So sort of cool. Uh, that's the best I can do. And uh, he gave that presentation outside afterwards. I was just standing there by myself and some other people were talking about the presentation Alan had given, and somebody turned to me, I don't even know who, uh, I can't remember, and said, uh, what do you think, Mike? What do you think a center is? And I said, I just think it's a failed haiku. <laughs> I was making a oh, <laughs> So you can't write haiku, so you call it a senru. And I, I, and I got some frowns, and uh, I dropped the joke. The reason I did it, and Kala's heard this because she attended HNA a dozen years later, uh, yes. where I was at, and uh, I, I told the, the story. I, I also wanted the name Haiku in the title, because when you Google Senru, very few things come up. So it, uh, you might get a couple hundred thousand. You put very Haiku smart. in it, millions. Very clever. So I wanted to be found. I want people to find me. So it's a joke. I actually got probably four or five people who said, this is ridiculous. I will never submit to you. You're, you're, you're failures. What kind of an idiot are you? I'm an idiot. You know, what do you want? You want to call me? I, I accept that. 
201, all of those people eventually got around to submitting. They forgave me. But the other thing is, I w- originally started, I was not going to, to keep doing it forever. I, was, I wanted to get eight to 10,000 senru in place, in one place, in a PDF, so that people could access it to see what the form was and how it was moving through Lovely. the world. Lovely. But it turned out, after year three, I thought, well, now who am I? Let's go for let's go for twenty. We're way over that now. Uh, <laughs> and and I want to and I and I want to say something too. I I I started with the concept of guest editors, Kala guest editor, yes. uh, and uh, 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 Lori Miner. Uh, yes, uh, we've we've had a lot of Kelly Savage Angel, who is my favorite. She's such a sweetheart and a great editor, great eye. And a sense of humor. I've done a bunch of busans with her, so I got the idea of pulling in yes. guest editors. Take a little bit of the heat off me, particularly when I didn't have any internet and I was having some real health problems. So uh, that that got me through. And then I've been very happy and very blessed to to, to talk uh, uh, Brian Rickard into being my yes. editor, and he he is doing. People get confused. He's taking six issues. I take six issues because it gets too confusing to have multiple editors and both two eyes yes. looking. And Hifsa says yes, and Rakala says no, and uh, Mike says maybe. And I, and besides, as a poet, I, I don't restrict myself. Uh, I try not to, but I tend to prefer. Uh, I've learned what Paul Miller likes. Okay, and I write a lot in it, it's not because I'm pa- pandering to him. Just that's it. I've learned the su- what Susan Anton. I think I got a feel for her, and that's so I I submit there once in a while. And uh, Carolyn at Hedgerow, um, same thing. So yes. I guess what I what I've been doing more than anything else is uh, having. I want to make sure now that it perpetuates itself. By the way, all of all of them are on not only online on our site in PDF, uh, but they're also online at the Haiku Foundation, and they're also online at the Anthology. Uh, can't say enough about Hansateki and and Don Baird. Great people. I mean, there's so many good people who helped me along the way, and those guys have been right there all the time. And uh, so. Why PDF? I want to say that to people because, uh, you know, why don't you do print? First of all, it cost me a million dollars and Kala could not afford to have me mail it to her in India. Right. Absolutely. You know, would you pay your $500 subscription? No. But I can, no. the PDF goes everywhere. And I wanted to go all over the world. I want, I want people in rural Pakistan who've got a lousy connection. They can download that PDF stick it on their computer or a thumb drive, pull it up and read it anytime. Africa, yes. the area. Uh, uh, and not everybody has what, what we have. I, now, the irony is I have some of the worst internet in the world because I'm in Presque Michigan in the middle of nowhere. But uh, I understand what the pain is. And I value print, but they're limited. So HIFSA, if you send me five great poems, I can publish them. Now, Modern Haiku, it's very unlikely that he, if he started doing that, he'd have a book the size of a dictionary. Just a lot of good poets submitting to Modern Haiku. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's, there's times, I know that uh, Charles Trumbull, uh, you, we were talking about a particular poet who, who I appreciated and he did. And, and uh, he said, I want to accept everything he says to me. <laughs> so good, but you can't. Uh, and that's the other thing I tell people about. Uh, I'm not an easy editor. I try and be as kind and nice as I possibly can. To be, and I try and help people if I can. But not everything makes it in. But I wanted the good poems to shine out. And I also want if Hissa, you you write on certain topics, okay? And some people would be say, ah, I don't know if that fits in my journal. I don't care. Yes. 
I don't care. Uh, if you want to write about the funniest things in your life or the saddest things in your life or political things in your life, right with me, when it comes to failed haiku, I have no barriers. Uh, on Facebook, I had to limit the politics because <laughs> I, I couldn't take the beatings I was getting from both sides. Uh, but uh, the I wanted to be as open as possible and I wanted to be able to publish as many good poems as I, as I found. And by the way, unbeknownst to me, accidentally in, in bumping into uh, uh, Brian Ricker, and I met him at several meetings and stuff, uh, and we've had a chance to hang out uh, together beforehand, and his, uh, his buddy uh, Ben Gah, who's written a fantastic book, uh, One Breath. Uh, but uh, so I, I got into, I, I know he's, he's, he's a young guy, but he's got a family. He's got a job. I'm retired. I'm old, <laughs> you know, so, but he's, he is, he's going to be the future of, of failed haiku. And I, I, the other thing about failed haiku, I want to say I wanted PDF and I also wanted this. I'm, I'm moving it toward YouTube more and more and more and more and more because I want people to meet each other. I want people to see Ifsa smile. Yes, I want to see that. I, it, it's, yes. it's one thing to look at a picture uh, on Facebook and, and see it, but I want to see real people. And over my shoulder here, you see the picture, the drawing right here. See that? You know who yeah. did that? Wow. Radostinia Dragsinova's daughter sent that to me. For okay. So that's my, that's my picture. Uh, and, and, and to me, those are the kind of connections I want people to make. Um, and somebody asked me, "What's your who's your favorite poet? I said, I don't know. Today, this minute. I mean, there's so many poets that I know now because of Phil's haiku. Yes. And you've done it. You've done it, uh, Mike. Uh, I think your perception, perception to include, to be inclusive, has made this so open that failed haiku has just, just bloomed. Well, yeah, but I, 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 think, will I will tell you this: my two favorites are uh, print journals, or Mayfly and Acorn, because you can put. Don't have a copy in front of me. You can put them in your pocket and carry them with you. Yes. Uh, and Susan Antolin is the product of uh, AC Messias who, who began it. And then when she left, she was stunning. I mean, she was a great writer, fabulous person, uh, good haiku poet. And, uh, and then Carolyn Hall took over. And Carolyn Hall's great. By the way, new book out. It's, it's a great book. I just sent it to somebody uh, the, today. But she, uh, uh, she took over, and I thought, I wasn't disappointed. I knew Carolyn would do a great job because she's a great poet, and I don't know her well. I've met her a couple of times in passing, and, you know, probably annoyed her or something. <laughs> but great person and great poet. What? Then I saw Acorn stay. Ah. Yes. And then, yes. by that time, I'm getting used to it. They turn it over to Susan Anton, and I know her, and I, I knew her, and I'd met her. We'd have had dinner at one of the silly HNA meetings or HSA meetings or something, probably HNA. It uh, tends to be more social at HNA. Uh, and uh, uh, that, you know, so I, I, Acorn is sort of my model for, for moving failed haiku on. And I have another one. Alexis Rotilla has not edited prune juice for years. But she passed it on, Liam Wils uh, Wilkinson, and then uh, uh, yes, on and on and on. Terry, yeah, Terry yes. French, my my friend. If I don't if I don't mention Terry, I think she'll send me a email and tell me you, I'm not your friend anymore. Oh, you're my friend. <laughs> I love I love Terry. I love Ray. I love their dog Chaka. But uh, she she was there. She was actually this is true story. She she was taught thinking about leaving because it was getting to be too much for her. She was busy, a lot of things happening in their lives. And I was trying to talk her out of it. And they were coming to visits. Uh, and I said, well, I'll wait, I'll wait. 
I have all these ideas and I thought, well, I'll be, I'll sit in the background, do all the formatting. I'll do the website. I'll, I'll edit one of the issues for you if you want. I had all these ideas and, and one of them, which I haven't done yet, but I'm actually still thinking about is a weekly, but uh, not monthly, but she Ooh. came and before I could say anything, I said, what are you going to do? I was opening my, I was about to get her to, to, to stay. And she said, I said, what are you going to do with produce? And she said, I'm leaving and I've already chosen uh, the editor to replace me. And she said, don't worry, you're going to like them. Don't worry. It was Steve Hodge, my Michigan boy and a friend of mine and a, and, a, and a great editor. But Prune Juice survives and it doesn't have, Alexis is not in the middle of it or even on the periphery of actually executing it to this day. Uh, she's doing her own thing, by the way. But uh, so I watched Acorn. I watched Prune Juice. And I, and I thought, well, it's, I, I may as well just keep going because these things don't die because of a person. And I will make the argument with you. It's not me. I have, you, do you want to kill failed haiku, modern haiku, acorn? We can get rid of them in an afternoon. If haiku poets stop submitting to you, if good poets stop submitting to you, you're out of business. <laughs> you're out of business. If, if you start accepting crap, you're out of business because Kala Ramesh doesn't want to be next to a, a bunch of junk. She wants to be, <laughs> no, I don't. She wants to be in a pile of diamonds, maybe, but not a pile of junk. It's not that isn't going to work. So, a, as an editor, I think uh, you know, uh, my job my job is not to tell you how to write poetry. I do not correct grammar, but I will all but the most egregious where I know it's a silly spelling error and you just left out a letter uh, and, I, and you know better. I don't correct things. I don't because your voice, uh, Kyla, you speak English very well, by the way. Okay. But you speak English like someone from India speaks English. Okay. Right. That, and, that's, that, that, and I speak English like a crazy mid Midwesterner. And if you go down to Texas, I think sound like this. They don't sound like me. And I lived in Georgia. And I had a, had a boss one time. And he, I'd come in the office and I'd be all energetic and telling him what was going on. And he would put his hand up and he'd say, we talk slow down here. <laughs> We're not stupid. We're not stupid, Mike. But I want to hear every word. Uh, <laughs> talk about getting a knife right in your heart but he was a great guy he was a great teacher in, in, in that respect and I think that uh, uh, and there are many aspects uh, of people's culture that comes out in their use of language and whether that so I am not going to tell people um, in Africa or in London they spell words silly color with a u What's the matter with those people in England? <laughs> no, they do it because they do it. And whiskey is spelled two ways. There's the way they spell it <laughs> in Europe and there's the way they spell it in the US. Sorry, there's an E or not. That, those are the kinds yes. of things. My spell checker will catch those things. By the way, I run, I have every single style manual on the planet. But when I write and I try and explain this to people and they all it's a fight every time i don't ever use a semicolon i think it's a stupid piece of nonsense and go google kurt vonnegut's uh, uh response to <laughs> to semicolons uh but I, I will i put a comma i use a comma to tell you when to i want the reader to stop just like right now so i want to write like I talk. And if I want to slow things down, I do. And I don't use caps and I don't use standard grammar. And by the way, Roberta Beery is one of those who, she taught me to be fearless. She, Marlene Mountain, they didn't care. They would try anything. And as I, uh, if you saw my interview with Roberta, 
Roberta is a lawyer by trade. They know the value of a comma more than an English teacher does. And they, but she will write stream of consciousness and with no caps. And in fact, she's, she's written hymen with absolutely no punctuation, not a period, not a comma, not, certainly not a semicolon, nothing, just uppercase, lowercase spaces. And so I got into, that's the way I want to be as an editor. I want to say, and so I had editors try and correct me all the time. Now it's trying to help me. And I appreciate it. I really do. And and then if Kala, if you were to re respond back to me and say, this poem stinks and, and you need to change line one or you, you lost me immediately. No, no, I take it. I take it from a lot of people. But I, what I don't take is needless silliness about word choices and topics. There's no topic that's off limits for me. None. I have, there's journals and I won't name them. They say, we don't accept things that are racist or what. Well, sort of goes without saying, I think. Does anybody think I'm going to publish that? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't need to say it. On the other hand, if you want to skirt a topic, you want to, want to take a point of view that's different from my own, 180 degrees. I have friends who are very conservative, very liberal. I'm very liberal on social issues, but I'm also a libertarian. I don't think anybody should tell anybody what to do or think. Nobody should be told what to think. So if, if you have a thought and you've expressed it poetically, I'll publish it. And I don't have to agree with it. And every once in a while, I get somebody who complains and I, and I have the standard answer Go down to the next page, you'll find a poem by Kala Ramesh you'll really like <laughs> that doesn't attack that topic. So don't worry about it. Just keep on moving down. Anyway. But, but you've done it. You've done it in all the things that you Okay, thank you so much, point. Mark. And we, we don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Hipsa, is anything that you would like to ask? No, I, I'm just listening to him because we, I don't want to interrupt him for further questions because he, I want to listen to him a lot of things and uh, I think I'm going to maybe note all these things after uh, watching this interview um, because he's talking about Senryu and his experience with failed haiku. So Mike, would you like to tell us about your favorite themes and what inspires you or touches you when you read or edit haiku? Yeah, wow. It, it sort of depends. You hit on it actually earlier on. Um, it's the poems of others that really teach you. That's what will teach you. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about one line haiku until Marlene Mountain smacked me in the head one day. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know, uh, I didn't, I would have told you uh, 20 years ago, oh, politics, uh, uh, things like that, those kind of personal topics. Oh, they're not part of haiku. It's cherry blossoms and frogs and all the rest of that jazz. By the way, I'm one of those who thinks the best cherry blossom poem and the best frog poem haven't been written yet. So don't stop writing them. But I, I look for things that, that touch me. That, that, and I look for people who have given me a hook in. Uh, I talk about her all the time, Michelle Ruth Bernstein. She has my number. She really does. She has my number. Uh, she writes stuff and it just resonates with me. Now, I didn't grow up like her. I don't have her background. Uh, I didn't go to Princeton. They wouldn't have me, I'm sure. But, <laughs> uh, it, but yet so, something about her and the way she thinks resonates with me. Okay. And, and so... Uh, that's what I look for. And I, uh, I, I look for things that I can stick myself into and, and, uh, and, and pull something out of. And Eric Amon said it back in the 60s. Uh, he wrote a book called The Wordless Poem. Which sounds odd. It, it, he was actually talking about Zen and haiku. Hmm. And uh, 
the, it's a wordless poem in the sense that we don't use all the words. I don't tell you, I had this terrible experience yesterday when I went to the grocery store and someone said this to me and it hurt me deeply. And I went home and I told three people and they were, they were upset. And we all went back to the grocery store and we got that. Uh, no, you get eight, 10 syllables to, to get that out. But because good poets can do that, and I do that some of the time, but I'm not the greatest poet that I've read. I have two students now uh, that are, uh, they may turn out to be much better poets than I ever could be. They, they're, they're all kinds of people out there, the poems of others. And uh, uh, I think that, uh, well, I just look for things that, that we use, overused words. I hate the word juxtaposition. It's a bunch of crap and I, that's too many syllables for a haiku poet. So I never use it, but even though I just did. But uh, I, in, if you look at the Japanese word that gets translated, it's either compare or contrast. I like contrast. There's, there's a contrast. Uh, and the contrast is very subtle sometimes. And sometimes it's very dramatic. And that's, so I'm really just looking for interesting things. And some things are fun. Alan Pizzarelli can write very sad topics. But he's also a funny guy who can write humorous things about himself. Frozen yeah. socks. Frozen socks. <laughs> I love it. That those are the kinds of things that I that I look for, things that are different and unusual. And even if I wouldn't write it myself, I can appreciate that somebody else had that experience sometimes it doesn't have to resonate with me in the sense that i recall something in my own life but i can see the other person having that experience and it broadens my sense so i think i'm nobody in the haiku world i, lo I love you too you're great you know i do but you're being too too kind the people who who I appreciate are the poets who create the really good poems, tens of thousands of poems in failed haiku. Yes. And I'm not saying every one would win an award, but there's a lot of good stuff there and a lot of good ideas for somebody to, to, to figure out. I also uh, value uh, Frog Pond. Uh, over the years, uh, people like Jim Cation, John Stevenson. I, I can't mention all my favorites today because it would, and we may kill the whole, we may be on here for 12 hours, but uh, both different editors, but with different approaches, different ways of looking at things. Yes. And when you look at their, the books, the, the, the uh, volumes of, fail, of uh, Frog Pond that they edited, they're both excellent, they're both different. And you see that all the time. Brian Rickard is different from me. Not a lot. Okay. He's not driving off a cliff. But I wouldn't mind if he did. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I don't care. But I, I'm enjoying what I do and I enjoy my life. I'm very, very, very fortunate to have lived a life that uh, that's had, had a lot of happiness. If tomorrow lightning strikes. Lovely. Lovely. I had Lovely. A good... Don't know what the next one will be like. Yes, Mike, quickly, what are your plans for failed haiku? I'm sure you'll be having a lot of things buzzing in your head. Or do you want, you don't want to disclose or you want to keep them? I, I think moving toward, toward YouTube, I'm still gonna keep the PDF version and things like that. I still wanna do that. Uh, I wanna broaden the types of things. We had Kaoka in here with, with Susan Birch and that was great. I wanna focus on, on different, different ways to approach it. We do a Hybin one every year with Roberta Beery. I hope she'll come back and do it again this year. Um, yes. That, what I wanna do is, is though is move it to different corners. And what I'm trying to do, YouTube has a lot of misinformation about Haiku and I, uh, the Haiku Foundation's there. Haiku Society of America's just begun. I, I have faith in Jay that he's gonna continue to do more things there. I'm hoping that HNA, uh, and CBEC, uh, Michael Dillon Welsh's thing, will be more involved because we have plenty of people. I'll, I'll match you one for one 
uh, every single academic, uh, uh, you know, we have articles written in Frog Pond, Modern Haiku, you name it, the supplements, the old supplements of uh, Acorn. Yes. That a lot of academics would latch on to and enjoy and use uh, to teach Haiku at the college level. Randy Brooks, of course, does it full time. Uh, and uh, I, what I want to do is try and push those things out onto the internet. It's fine to have books. I, I had at one time 3,000 items. Mm. And I've given away more than two thirds of it. But uh, I think the, the key to this, the, to the future of failed haiku is going to be more of the internet, more multimedia, more meeting people. And if so, I don't care if everybody starts doing these things. People copy, fine. You want to copy me? Go ahead. Yes. Knock yourself out. Start a new zine. Lori Miner did. Didn't bother me. Lori's doing a great job. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want more. I don't want less. And I want more avenues for, and more people editing and more people uh, thinking about it. It's that's what's important. And I, uh, I think that uh, the, the future of failed haiku is, uh, I have no idea what it's, what, where it's gonna go, but I can tell you, it's gonna be a lot more electronic in the future. I'm gonna start doing readings uh, from each edition, just picking up poems, not the best. I don't like the best of stuff. Yes. Interesting things. This is an interesting poem. It takes an odd approach. That's what I want. Those are the poems that I want to read from other people. And uh, so I'm, there's a lot of lot of things. And Brian and I will cook some stuff up and and surprise you. But uh, I, I think uh, and uh, he's a he's a he's a great one. I, he got interviewed here by uh, 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 when prune juice started. Tanya gave it, it's, it's to me. It's there's so many people that are. Uh, that are out there influencing me. Uh, Tanya McDonald's uh, uh, new uh, new print journal too is, is fantastic. But all of these all of these things I think meld together, and we're all in it together. I'm Johnny Appleseed. Just want to throw a bunch of seeds out there and hope somebody picks it up and starts writing like it. Yes, great. If so, over to you. Oh, you're 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 muted. You muted. If so, you're muted. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mike, tell us, um, what do you want people to take away from this interview? Anything in particular? Uh, anything on your mind regarding this interview? Uh, maybe you can conclude it in in few words. Yeah. Something like that. Real simple. I've had two very good people to share the interview with. <laughs> two very good people. And I can't, can't, and it surprised me when you asked me, because this will come as a shock. Nobody asked me for an interview. <laughs> yeah, but, but now you've got it. You've got some things out of me. You know some things about me that I haven't shared with other people. And uh, I appreciate the two of you. And I, I, both of you are doing things for haiku in your own way, in your own place, in your own culture. And, and I am in awe of the two of you. Well, thank you. And it's mutual. <laughs> uh, it's mutual, Mike. I've always admired the way you, you have carried out things. I've always admired the way you, you made an idea work. <laughs> and that is not easy. You've done it. So we are honored. Hipsa and me are honored that we could uh, take this interview. And uh, yes, thank you so Isn't much. It, yeah, it's a sweet revenge. You asked us some <laughs> tough questions. So it was our turn. And we have taken the revenge. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you both. And thank you so much, Mike, thank for you. your time. Thanks, and I think you know a lot about the other aspects of your life. And uh, I think every aspect is uh, a great inspiration for all of us. And 
I hope we'll continue with you in future with some other uh, interviews or maybe some other themes and topics. And yes, we'll talk about our future work or maybe our projects related to micro poetry. And uh, I hope you will invite us again. <laughs> Don't invite it. You have an open invitation. Call me anytime. <laughs> Thanks, thank you, Mike.